Um, I'm not sure which one is uh, the, the one you're referring to. Um, oh, the one for Maldives, yeah? Okay, uh, okay, right. Now, how to, um, how to work for the betterment of the Ummah in, in the Maldives, uh, trying to uh, benefit from, from contemporary uh, modernization at the same time, not uh, rejecting some of the um, good traditions. Um, here we have to, uh, yesterday we touched uh, briefly on this uh, idea of, um, of uh, rightly balanced or justly balanced moderation, the wasatiyah of Islam. And I think we need to, uh, to understand that uh, deeply uh, so that, um, because that is a, a characteristic of, of Islam and the ummah. So we need to understand how to, uh, to realize that kind of, um, of moderation. Um, and of course, if this is uh, institutionalized in the teachings of our religion, then it will help the younger generation to actualize this uh, sense of moderation. Um, uh, I'm a bit more worried about the, the uh, not so much the educational future of the Maldives, but uh, the physical presence of the Maldives, uh, given the uh, global warming. Uh, so I hope uh, you should also be more realistic to think about what to do when the next tsunami strikes. Uh, we remember in the last tsunami, I think several atolls and islands uh, dis disappeared. So I think we need also to think about the immediate problem of, of this um, a real threat of physical annihilation if global warming uh, becomes more serious. I think that's something that we, and I guess the whole world will have to think about it, uh, so I think you should also be thinking about that. But uh, uh, as for the um, striking the balance, uh, the um, uh, justly balanced moderation between uh, useful modernity and uh, a sacred tradition, the, the sacred part of the tradition, I mean, that is something that is um, uh, embedded within the Quranic worldview, and we need to, uh, to understand that. So that would be my brief response. Um, I guess that's all. Firstly, I would like to apologize for being late. I was told that it is to start at 11 o'clock. So that's why I was late. And when you are late, you miss a lot of things. So I don't think I'm qualified to make comments I once wrote on my blog something about religion, and I was told off by people who say, I know nothing about religion. That is, I don't know why they make me president or perkim, or head of perkim, if, since I know nothing about religion. But uh, uh, I, I study the Quran. Of course, I have to study it in Malay and English. I cannot study it in Arabic. Although I completed my Khatam Quran when I was a boy, a young boy. But I couldn't understand anything that it was in the Quran. And uh, when I went to study medicine, there were lots of questions that I couldn't answer. Uh, it was not easy to say this is just faith. Uh, because there were so many things that I, I study which explains things in a scientific manner. And I couldn't just say that, well, this is what God created. So I had to spend quite a lot of time asking myself uh, about my own faith. And uh, finally, of course, I found the answer. The answer is a very long one, so I wouldn't bother you <laughs> at the moment. But uh, coming back to uh, the religion, I think uh, people tell me that the Quran, the, the Malay and the English version of the Quran is not the Quran. The Quran is the Arabic version. But then uh, when I ask myself, I learned uh, the religion from whom? Did I learn it from an Arab who told me everything in, Ar in Arabic? The answer is that I learned about my religion in my own language. So that couldn't be Islam. If the Quran in Malay is not, is, is not about Islam, then the teacher who teaches me in Malay, then he's not teaching me about Islam. 
So the thing is that it is his interpretation uh, that he is conveying to me. And the people who write, uh, who translate the Quran, these are very learned people. And they are much more likely to be correct than the guru who taught me in Malay. So that is why I went back to the Quran written in Arabic, uh, written in Malay and in English. And I compared uh, several translations where there are no differences. I found it easy to answer, to accept. Also, of course, in the Quran, there are two types of verses. One is very clear. The other one is made out of allegories, of stories, which we can interpret in many ways. So what has happened in 1,400 years is that there are many translators, many interpreters of the Quran. But their interpre interpretations are not exactly the same. In fact, some of them are so different that their people, their followers, tend to condemn the, other, the followers of the other interpreters as not being Muslim. And that is the cause of the division within the Muslim Ummah. Today, we are divided in, by our acceptance of different teachings by different imams and ulamas. But uh, as we all know, there was only one Islam that was brought by the Prophet. So now we have about 1,000 different Islam, including one brought by Ayapin and <laughs> Believe me, I mean, they were so faithful to his teachings that they were prepared to drink the water that he washes his feet in. That's the degree of faith they have in him. But uh, you can understand that when you dedicate or you accept totally the teachings of certain uh, ulamas or imams, then you are not really following what is found in the Quran. That is why I call myself a Muslim fundamentalist. I don't accept totally the teachings of the different Imams, whether they be Sunni or Shia or Wahhabi or whatever. I accept what is in the Quran, which I read in English and in Malay, and I find nothing wrong in the Quran. Everything is very positive. And if you follow the teachings of the Quran, you will be a good man you will be able to build a good community if you follow the teachings of the Quran. But once you come down to accepting the interpretations of different ulamas and imams, then you get confused. One imam says this, the other says that. To the point, the difference is such that we are prepared to fight and kill each other. You see the, the Shias and the Sunnis killing each other in Iraq, in Pakistan. I mean, it's not the Quran which told them to, to kill, but they kill each other because of the teachings of this ulama. And of course, a Muslim should not kill other Muslim. That is very clear in the Quran. But when you say, well, although he claims to be a Muslim, but he actually is not a Muslim, therefore I can kill him. You see, you give yourself excuses like that. To me, that is not acceptable. If you say that a Muslim may not kill another Muslim, we are not going to, we should not go around trying to make out that he is not really a Muslim so that we can kill him. So our present situation, the situation of the Ummah today, the community today, is that it is very divided by different interpretations of the religion, by different ulamas and, uh, and uh, imams. And also, of course, we are now divided uh, politically, ideologically, and whereas initially there was no such thing as a nation state at the time when the Prophet brought Islam to us, there was no nation state. So he, the, there was only the community. And the community at the time of the Prophet was very small. These are his companions, the people who were with him, through thick and thin. And it was easy to think about a community that uh, regards each other as brothers. But of course, now we have 1.6 billion uh, Muslim. 
they are still the community, and uh, but to think of them as if they are companions or your brothers, it has become very difficult, especially as our understanding of Islam is different one from the other. So I think the concept of community as being uh, our obligation to support what is right and reject what is wrong, I think is the best uh, uh, understanding of the of the community, the Muslim community. But with regard to your your worry about going back to your country to contribute towards its development, etc. Uh, I went through the history of Islam and I find that in the early years, there were so many Muslim scientists, physicians, astronomers, uh, um, uh, geographers, etc. In the early years, they are all well known to us. Uh, and, and then suddenly, they seem to disappear. This happened about the 15th century of the, of the Christian era. And during the 15th century, there came these teachings of fatwa that what you need to study, ikhra, actually is all about reading about religion only. Only studying religion will give you merit, dapat pahala. Only stud studying religion. Other subjects are secular. Uh, they don't use the word secular, but other subjects are irrelevant, will not give you merit, tak dapat pahala. And at that stage, you find that the Muslim scientists and physicians, etc., seem to have disappeared after the 15th century. But the worst part of it is that it was also at that time that the Europeans, the Christians in Europe, realized that the of the, the existence of the great Islamic civilization. And they wanted to know why is it that Islam prospered and became so powerful in, the, in those years. So they studied Arabic to gain access to the libraries of Cordoba and, uh, and uh, Baghdad so that they can acquire the knowledge that was with the Muslims.